All right, and thanks for tuning in to the Speed Traveler Roadshow here on KHTS Radio AM 1220. Also, you can find us at hometownstation.com. Also, wherever you get your podcasts. And finally, you can reach out to us on social media. You can get all of our shows, and that's at The Speed Traveler uh, on both uh, Instagram and also on YouTube. And my name is Charlie Frank. I'm joined here by my co-host, Chris Everton. How are you doing today, Chris? You know, I'm doing great, Charlie. It's great to be on the show again and uh, be uh, doing this live once more. And, you know, I, honestly, I didn't come to the studio today. Uh, I mean, if I if I really want to say I didn't show up because of weather, that would be a bit of a lie. But I'm down <laughs> here in San Diego. The surf is looking pretty good, and it's a beautiful, sunny day. Right. So I figured, you know, after the show, I'm going to go have some fun. <laughs> yeah, it's a good day to, to not be on the 5 freeway going between San Diego and Los Angeles. <laughs> it really is. Well, we've got some interesting things to talk about today. We are going to talk about the Bentley Mark. That's our featured mark of the day. And Chris and I just got back from an amazing road trip that we took with Bentley last week. Uh, And coming up in our uh, next segment, or actually in segment three, we're going to talk a little bit about that trip. We're also going to talk about the Formula One race. Uh, There was a great Formula One race done at the Australian Grand Prix. A week ago, and coming up is the Japanese GP, so that'll be in our final segment today. Uh, Also, Chris, in uh, segment B, we're going to talk about EV. I mean, we're on a radio station that has political radio all day long, so we might as well get political, right? Well, you know, I don't even (laughs) know if it's political, but the EV, what we'll call controversy here in the U.S., is is kind of exploding. I mean, there's a lot to be said on both sides of that coin, so I'm looking, you know, to go electric or to not go electric. So I'm looking forward to having that uh, heated discussion, if you will, with you and perhaps some listeners. Yeah. Uh, By the way, if you want to reach out to us, you can reach out to us on the aforementioned uh, YouTube channel, which is The Speed Traveler. Also on Instagram, at The Speed Traveler. And Chris, it's uh, springtime. And uh, one of our favorite times of the year, we have some great stuff coming up. We are going to be doing the show live from La Oprah Restaurant on the corner of First and Pine on Long Beach Grand Prix weekend on both April 19 and April 20. So if you're out there and you're looking for something fun to do on those nights, come on by La Oprah and uh, say hi to us. So I'm sure if you've got some questions, we can answer questions there. But we always have a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, uh, the Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach is always on the, the top of my calendar. It's one of my favorite times of year. Uh, it's probably one of the best street courses in the world, if not, you know, uh, the best street course. I mean, it's hard to compete with Monaco, but this is certainly the Monaco of the West. Uh, you know, now Formula One is in Miami, which is another very interesting street course. But really, the Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach with its storied history, is, in my opinion, one of the greatest motorsports events in the world. Yeah, it started in 1975, so they're coming up on their 50th uh, annual event. I mean, really pretty incredible to think about that. And you're right, it is like the Monaco of the United States. The only difference is you can actually pass at the Long Beach Grand Prix. You can't pass anywhere at Monaco. Yeah, and you know, and as Jim McKellen, who is our, was our guest a couple weeks ago on the show, and You know, the Long Beach Grand Prix, the Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach has a a ton of spectator accessibility. So it's not like you're closed off or cordoned off like some of the things we found like at the the Las Vegas Formula One race last year and some other events we've been at. The the Acura Grand Prix of Long Beach is really spectator friendly. So, you know, whether you're really into the auto racing or some of the other events that are going on or the lifestyle uh, the fun stuff, that, all the fun stuff and shows that are going on, you know, rock concerts and what have you. It's just a great time for the entire family. Yeah, that that's a great point. The the Stadium Super Trucks will be back again this year, and that's Robbie Gordon's series where he builds 15 identically prepared trucks, and uh, it's really pretty funny. I mean, the, the, the trucks, you know, they set up these steel ramps on the front straightaway, and if you haven't seen it, Google it or go to YouTube and, and pull it up. I mean, it's incredible. The, the trucks jump about 150 feet and about 30 feet high. 
Yeah, we even have some great uh, uh, stadium super truck footage on our YouTube page at the Speed Traveler as well. Yeah, no, no, for sure. But if you haven't seen it, uh, and a lot of people might be listening for the first time and don't really know what the Speed Traveler is or does. Uh, but Chris and I are professional race car drivers, professional race car driving instructors. We're stunt drivers for the movie industry, and we've bought and sold, I don't know, probably 200 cars. And we like to share our knowledge. We've, you know, we've done really well on some of the cars. Uh, and we're definitely getting better, but we've lost our tails on some too. So by sharing yeah. those mistakes, it gives people an idea how to get into the classic car, exotic car market. Yeah, you don't need to be a race car driver to be a car enthusiast. You know, there's there's just people that like to cruise and have a good time. I mean, look at the low rider community. Uh, uh, you look at the drifting community, which is, is competition, but it's not necessarily racing. And you know what? Like you mentioned in, in the earlier in the show, we're going to be talking about that great Bentley rally we took from Newport to uh, Palm Desert and back. Uh, you know, so it's, you don't have to be a race car enthusiast to be a car enthusiast. No, I agree. That's a good point. If you go to our, our page on YouTube, our, our channel, We've got dozens and dozens of videos about particular cars that we love and that we've test driven, not just new cars, but classic cars, mostly classic cars. And, uh, and we've also highlighted some of our adventures going from, uh, from Universal Studios to Malibu via Mulholland Highway. It's one of my favorite. Uh, and then we've you know done a, a, we did another trip from Malibu to San Francisco, and uh, that was really fun along Highway 1. Yeah, and these are only the videos that we've actually shot. I mean, we've taken so many car rides around the country that if you ever have a question as to some fun routes anywhere in this beautiful country of ours, a driving-centric country, um, you know, ask us, uh, ask us about it. Because, I mean, we've been all over the place from, from California to Florida. There are some great roads to drive. Yeah. And great cars to drive on them. Yeah. No, there really are. Uh, so I think, you know what, Chris, why don't we take a quick break and then we'll come back and we're going to talk a little bit about the, uh, electronic vehicle market, including our buddies over at the Fisker manufacturing company. Uh, and, uh, we'll take it from there. Once again, this is the speed traveler roadshow and you're listening to KHTS radio AM 1220. All right. Welcome back to the Speed Traveler Roadshow here on KHTS Radio AM 1220. Also available at hometownstation.com and on our YouTube page, which is the Speed Traveler. Also at Instagram, you can find us. And anywhere, Chris, you get your podcast downloaded. Yeah. I mean, find us, just Google the Speed Traveler, you'll find us someplace. And, <laughs> you know, always remember to hit that like button, the follow button, and share us with your friends. And ask us your questions. Uh, if we say something smart and you think that's uh, uh, poignant and you agree, give us a thumbs up. If you think we're knuckleheads, give us a thumbs down. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so funny. I think uh, I, we certainly got a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of thumbs up and thumbs down when we were talking about our Prince Valiant haircuts. So one of my, <laughs> one of my favorite episodes from back in uh, November of last year. Uh, but you know what? <laughs> oh. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I was just going to say, yeah, it was it was a period of time when we both desperately needed not only a haircut, but a hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's so funny how people are always harassing. And they're like, dude, wear a hat. Just, just wear a hat and be done with it. I'm like, all right, so I'm wearing my hat today. I don't know about you. Well, you know, since I'm not on video today, I don't need to have my Sparco <laughs> safety hat on. Uh, I love that. One bad haircut at a time. <laughs> nice plug for Sparco. <laughs> that was good. Uh, all right. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, EVs and government mandates. Yeah, right. And government <laughs> mandates of EVs. So we've, we've brought this subject up before. And Chris and I are not anti-EVs. I think there's a place and time for them. If you live in Santa Monica, California, for instance, and you want to be really clean, uh, at least, you know, in driving around, maybe not how the car is manufactured, but in your driving and it makes you feel good, then I think there's a great place for it. Now, if you live in upstate New York, you're not going to get much life or you're not going to get much charge out of your battery. 
So it doesn't really work. There are also places in Texas, places outside Los Angeles where you have to drive a lot. You know, it it, it just isn't quite perfected yet. And uh, I don't I don't I don't ever see it. I don't, I don't ever see it working, Chris, unless they could figure out a way that you pull in a service station and there's like some, you know, 1.3 million gigawatt thing that just zaps the car and gives it an instant, <laughs> it gives it an instantaneous charge, right? I mean, what about you? Yeah, you know, I agree with you. You brought up a whole lot of aspects to discuss in that. And one of, the, one of those is, you know, it works in the span of usage of an electric car. Yep. Sure, it is absolutely going to have a perhaps a lighter impact on air quality with exhaust. Right. Um, you know, so that one-to-one aspect there kind of works, but it does, you mentioned it, it does not account for the uh, mining and construction and shipping and distribution of these vehicles, let alone the infrastructure to support that. Right. Um, and I think, but I think, you know, to just, to take one topic at a time, I think the biggest issue, one of the biggest issues we have here in America, and this is not necessarily a global issue uh, yet, or it, maybe it is, and we just haven't heard the same stories out of Europe and other places, but here in America, it, 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 the mandates are suggesting a one-to-one replacement for gas vehicles with the electric vehicle, and that solution just fails to address some huge issues across the board. You know, you mentioned it, the ability to charge a car more easily in, in bigger cities like a Santa Monica, Los Angeles, or on the east coast of New York. But what do you do in between all of that? Um, it doesn't, you know, EV cars, if you're trying to be efficient, generally speaking, don't have the, the, the most efficient electric vehicles that have the least amount of impact, don't have the greatest range in the world either. So getting from town to town doesn't really work in this one size fits all solution. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And also on the uh, the pollution aspect, they don't. If you're talking about CO two emissions while you're actually driving, forgetting the manufacturing process, but just the driving part. Uh, I read an interesting article recently that said the fact that the cars are generally a thousand plus pounds heavier than combustion engine cars. What's happening is there's little particles that come off the tires. Uh, and these are coming off the tires and basically at a much higher rate than a combustion engine vehicle that weighs a thousand pounds less. And this is causing its own form of pollution in, in the bigger areas like Los Angeles. So, yeah, that, I, it, I think what's weird is there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of thought process going into going to all EV vehicles. Like California states that every car has got to be EV by 2035. Well, that's great, you know, and, and I also like to be the queen of England, but, uh, you know, that's not going to happen. So, <laughs> so that's not going to happen. So I think the problem is you have these politicians that are just throw these numbers out because it sounds cool and looks good and that there's just no thought behind how you're actually going to get there. Yeah, and, and, and that goes to the infrastructure aspect of it all. I mean, you mentioned that the cars are a 1,000 pounds heavier, and, and it, I'm certain a lot of drivers have noticed that the, the, the lane closest the, the first, to the off-ramps and on-ramps of the road on a lot of roads are usually much thicker concrete and maybe not quite as smooth. And that's because those are generally the truck lanes, right. whereas the inside lanes and the HOV lanes and things like that are usually blacktop, which are a little more cost-effective to assemble, right. a little lighter weight, and also a lot quieter. You mentioned the tires and tire noise and, right. and tire pollution. Right. Um, and with these cars getting heavier and heavier, that's going to have an effect on the durability of the infrastructure that it exists now and, quite frankly, really hasn't been updated in a lot of places other than a little bit of pothole repair uh, across the country. I mean, I know a lot of, you know, people with Sandag, you know, and Caltrans fans and was the AZ dot in Arizona. Right. I and mean, they do a great job and an un- unheralded job of building and maintaining this freeway infrastructure, but it's going to re- require a change and adaptation to the electric vehicle and its weight and, and a couple other issues as far as charging cars. 
Yeah, and, and what's interesting to note is the largest vehicle manufacturer in the world right now, consumer vehicle, is Toyota. And they build over 11 million cars and sell over 11 million cars a year. So they really have their act together. And what percentage of those 11 million <laughs> cars are all electric? Yeah, so I think that at last year it was 2.3, if I remember correctly, two, only 2.3% of their fleet is electric. And that rate wasn't really going up at all. I mean, they only expect to sell 100,000 EVs in all of 2024. So you you mentioned Toyota a few weeks ago, Chris, and I think, what was it, the, the 1690 rule? Yes, yes. Yeah, so basically. Uh, and so one, for every single all electric car that they build, it takes the same amount of energy and cost to build six, uh, hybrid cars or 90 combustion engine cars. So yeah. that, think about that. One ele- all-electric car or 90 combustion engine cars for the same cost. Yeah. it's un- I mean, that fact is unbelievable. So one electric car, uh, they can build one electric car, and with the same amount of energy, they can build 90. And components, they could build 90 combustion engine cars. So I, I clearly, yeah. you know, the, uh, the government's not taking this into consideration. And, you know, the other thing is on top of it is on a, a geopolitical level is we're gutting the United States is gutting their automotive industry and they're going to have to use batteries and lithium and battery components provided by China. And it just doesn't seem to me you know, I might be a regular layperson, but I'm a car enthusiast, and you are too. But that just doesn't seem smart to me to hand over our our automotive industry to the Chinese. Yeah, and you know, I'm going to take this just outside of the car industry for just a moment. If we consider this, everybody on in 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 the United States, if not, well, I would say 99.9 percent of everyone in the United States has a cell phone, and everyone's using these cell phone tires. And every single one of those cell phone towers comes from China. Now, the one exception to that rule is military bases. Right. (laughs) And cell phone towers on military bases, it's mandated that it cannot, it specifically says, cannot be come from China. Components cannot come from China. They can be sourced elsewhere, hopefully 90, you know, mostly here in the United States. But that's something military bases just in cell phone towers is taking into consideration. Yeah, so. <laughs> and, yeah, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, why why would you hand that over to an adversary? I mean, you know, it's not 25 years ago where China was an emerging nation. You know, they, they've got a target on our back here, and it makes no sense to gut our, our in- industry. I, I think, and, and we both agree on this point, one of the things that we really should be doing is looking for alt fuels. And you had mentioned yeah, that to- Toyota was looking at an ammonia based fuel. Yeah. I mean, it's still, I mean, and it works, but it's still a little, you know, ammonia, it's a little bit toxic. And we were having some headsy conversations with some really intelligent people the other week. And, you know, they, they brought up the question, why are we not looking more hydrogen? Right. Yeah, you know, and point. hydrogen fuel cells, and it's it's you know pretty much readily available and pretty easy to make. Right. Yeah, it's <laughs> you true. Know, why aren't we looking at some form of hybrid? Ooh, there's a word, hybrid type of technology. And and look again, Charlie, we talk about this all the time. It's not that we're anti all electric vehicles or electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles. It's that we're 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 really questioning the path in which we're this is being force fed down our throats and 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 then like you know i'm going to take it to the to the infrastructure aspect of that you know here in the u.s there's there's no infrastructure for this absolutely zero infrastructure whereas this and i'm going to throw a a a a comparison if you will to um a country that i'm very fairly familiar with and that's switzerland and just let's look at the rail Uh oh time's up but i'm going to run (laughs) long on this one because i feel it's important Switzerland first brought their uh, train into their country in the 1840s. And it was, you know, a gas, diesel, steam engine. They had, a, 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 you know, a steam engine run on coal right. and uh, coal. And then they looked at combustion engines. 
but they quickly, quickly realize that they need to do something that is not uh, dependent on outside resources. And right. they quickly moved to electric trains in, 18, in the 1890s, in the 1890s. Yeah. So for that long, they've been developing an infrastructure to run an electric transportation system that is readily available, and we don't have that. We yeah. just don't have that here. As a matter of fact, some industries went out of their way to destroy that um, not that many uh, decades ago. I mean, you know, I'm going to throw a movie out there, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And if you watch that movie, you'll learn exactly what happened to the red car in Los Angeles, which was an electric an electric rail system. Yeah, it, it got shot down by the uh, by the the fuel companies. Exactly. The big oil companies. Yeah, that I mean, I, I agree with you totally, and I think the problem is it's just far too easy on social media, and it's just far too easy for politicians to be like, yeah, we're going to go all green in 2035, but there's just no, no thought going into how in the world do you get there. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well. You know, and I have a lot more to add to that, but maybe we should take a quick break um, and resume this conversation on the other side of this commercial message. That sounds good. You're listening to the Speed Traveler Roadshow. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. All right, and welcome back to the Speed Traveler Roadshow here on KHTS Radio in Newhall, California. You can also find us anywhere you get your podcasts, and you can see our lovely mugs if you go on to our YouTube channel, which is the Speed Traveler. I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Evertson, and we were just having an intense conversation about electric vehicles and uh, Chris you had a few more thoughts before we move on to our amazing Bentley trip last week <laughs> yeah you know and that Bentley trip was just so awesome and I, I hate to kind of lean into that on a tirade about electric cars <laughs> <laughs> but, but to continue the tirade <laughs> uh you know our, our biggest issue here in the U.S. is is one of infrastructure and and I don't want to pick a fight with Elon Musk because I really appreciate what he's done in pushing our industries in a number of directions, right. uh, from automotive to the space industry. I just got to watch a SpaceX launch the other night uh, here on the West Coast. It was really cool. But, you know, we are the United States is relying on Elon Musk as an individual and a brand Tesla to create the infrastructure around the country for charging centers to charge these cars. Uh, that we see on the road, and there's a big push for the trucking industry to go in that direction. And it's like, well, how the heck are you going to charge a truck? Right. You know <laughs> exactly. And, and you know, I mean, and, and how long? What size is that battery going to need to be? And how heavy is that truck going to need to be? Once again, going to the Federal Highway Administration and asking the question, how much weight can this highway take? <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and it's kind of crazy. And, and to the infrastructure thing, I did mention Switzerland and the rail system um, and how this basically an electric electrified system. Not only are the, 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 tra the, tra the uh, trains that go across the country and in other countries electric, but the local trams and buses in, in, in the majority of the cities are electric or on alternative fuels. Um, but now if we consider the trucking industry, this is something I read recently that I found really, really interesting. Similar to the railroad, what they're looking at is putting sectors of, of, of wire lines on the highways, just like a train uh, system, where the trucks can run underneath them for about a kilometer and gain that charge. Right. Have a little bar that comes up like, like the electric train, get that charge and charge up for about a kilometer at a high rate and then move on to the next one, basically keeping on the keeping the trucks out of gas stations and on the highways right. and much more efficiently, much more quickly getting from point to point. But again, it's an infrastructure question, uh, or let me rephrase, solution that we are not putting in place here in the United States. Yeah, no, just, just having the truckers go and charge a I mean, they could have a battery that goes 800 miles. It's still not going to work well. You know, they're going to – and anything short of uh, hiring uh, Doc Brown from the movie Back to the Future and <laughs> building flux capacitors where they do instantaneous charges, anything short of that is not going to work. But I hadn't heard – what you're talking about, and that does make a lot of sense, but it would be a huge project. 
yeah, a huge undertaking, but, you know, they have systems in place that that will allow for that, you know, I mean, versus like here in California, we're spending, I don't know, $100 billion on a high-speed train to go from a a, a vacant desert to another vacant desert. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I feel like those farms could be used in a different way. If you want to go electric, maybe we use some of that that money from infrastructure to go to building uh, an infrastructure for supporting electric or hybrid vehicles. But, uh, yeah, I, 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 a lot of good ideas surrounded by a lot of stupidity, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, that, that pretty much sums it up. All right, well, before we run out of time in this segment, let's talk a little bit about our featured mark today, which is Bentley. And we had a great experience last week, Chris, where we were able to drive Bentleys from Newport Beach, California, over the mountains, the Santa Rosa Mountains, and into Palm Desert. And uh, what a great experience that was. Oh, my gosh. I mean, first of all, the Bentley vehicles are beautiful. When you when you consider – when you, I really love their new 12-cylinder electric engine that produces du- 900 foot-pounds <laughs> of torque. Well, it's oh, W12, it's, the W12 engine, it's, yes. It's, it's not electric? It's Oh, yeah. No, it's not electric. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what a car. I mean, across the board, those cars are absolutely beautiful. The fit and finish is just tremendous. And you mentioned, you know, we made it out to Palm Desert. I mean, the roads that we took, the scenery we saw was just, the places we went en route were just unbelievable. I mean, we ended up at the La Quinta Resort in Palm Desert, which if you've never been to the La Quinta Resort in Palm Desert, you definitely need to make a a weekend of it or at least an overnight trip. It's just fantastic. Yeah, it really, and just to be clear, it's not the La Quinta Motel that you see everywhere. Yeah. This is the La Quinta Resort, which was built in the 1920s. It's 100 years old. It has all this amazing Hollywood history because back in the day, the Hollywood movie stars signed a contract that said they had to stay within two and a half hours driving distance of Los Angeles. Uh, and so they couldn't fly to Cabo or wherever. They couldn't fly to whatever it was at the, at the time, Acapulco. They couldn't go to Hawaii. They couldn't go to Florida. Uh, they had to stay two and a half hours driving distance away from the studio. So it became this mecca for the, the Hollywood rich and famous back in the 1920s and 30s. And uh, it just, the place is just so full of history. We're talking about the La Quinta Resort in La Quinta, California. It's a five-star place, and uh, what a great time we had. Oh, yeah. I mean, the restaurants there on site are amazing. The people are incredible. Yeah. You know, everyone that works there is super, super friendly. Uh, we got to meet some amazing characters. And speaking of amazing characters, I mean, we took this journey with about 15 people. Uh, and how many cars? We had eight cars, eight Bentleys on the road. And, I mean, what a great gaggle of characters yeah. that we got to take this adventure on. Yeah, it really was. And and for those of you familiar with Southern California and for those of you who aren't but want to take an incredible road trip, uh, we started in Newport Beach, California, and we took the toll road, which is Highway 73 South, to the 5 Freeway. We went about two miles and we got off at Ortega Highway, Highway 74. And, and that's where the fun starts. Yeah. And right there at the 74. And it was a, a great trip. They've been working like crazy on Highway 74, Ortega Highway. And I was impressed at all the bridges that had been built over the years and how smooth the road was. But what, what a great trip over Highway uh, 74. Yeah, we'll talk about the successful infrastructure. Yeah, and then from there we uh, got on to the Highway 15. Highway uh, Ortega Highway ends up in a town called Lake Elsinore. We got on the 15 freeway. We went south to Temecula, to the wine country, to the Pont family vineyard, and uh, had a nice lunch there. Yeah, that was really lovely. I mean, there's a number of vineyards that are absolutely beautiful there. You know, you mentioned the Pont Vineyard where we saw it. Callaway is yeah. absolutely beautiful. I think that's where we're going to head off to the next time we go through. Right. Um, and then from there, the roads are fun and winding, and the, the topography just changes so rapidly. Right, yeah. It's called this. So we, we end up from there. We took Highway 79. I think we – connected to 371 it ended back on the 74 but in this area at this part of the stretch it's called 
the palms to Pines Highway. So we went through some pine trees and then all of a sudden you go around a corner and it's rocks and desert. And uh, how great was the scenic outlook at the Coachella Valley outlook? Oh, I mean, it was the valley was clear with all the rains and the winds we've had, the air quality and the, the was perfect. And the visibility was 100% clear. You could see the entire valley. You could see the road as the road as it winds down into the Palm Desert area. Uh, you know, and you can look up at the top topography and you can see some, uh, you know, some bighorn sheep and some mules that were running around. And uh, I think you actually saw a Gila monster at one point. <laughs> yeah, I did. I didn't know what was next to the car. And I, I took a second look and it was a Gila monster. So, yeah, really cool stuff. And also that part of, uh, of Highway 74 yeah, if you've ever seen the old movie, It's a Mad, Mad, Mad World, that was the famous scene where I think it was Spencer Tracy drives off the cliff, right? And uh, that is, yeah, and and that's where that is correct. Yeah, classic and, movie, and the big W. Yeah, under the, the big, big w. w. So from there, we uh, drove the short distance down. It took us about if it, you were driving straight through, I'd say it'd take about two and a half hours from Newport to Lake Quinta Resort. But when we got to Lake Quinta yeah. Resort. We parked the Bentleys right in front, and uh, as you mentioned, they you know they're not paying us to say this. They were incredible hosts. the The general manager uh, was who, whose name escapes me at the moment was really pretty amazing. And uh, there was a restaurant called Morgan's. The general manager there, his name was Noe. He was fantastic. Nancy helped us a lot over at the resort, and Bridget, of course. Um, and yeah. uh, what a what a great great trip. Yeah, it really, it really was, and we kind of did. I mean, the, the route back was slightly varying, uh, you know, very slightly. Uh, but it was just such, it was such a cool thing to see the transitions of from driving down the the road with these palm tree lined roads, getting up into the desert, and then at the, the higher mountain elevations, just these beautiful forests of pine trees. You yeah, know? and it's just, it's just. I mean, it's just it was absolutely gorgeous. But you know, one of my favorite stops, I have to say, and we made a bunch of them. One of my favorite stops was when we all made it to the Mott uh, Classic <laughs> Car Museum. That was amazing. I mean, Mr. Mott was there, and you know, and he gave us a a, 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 lot, a rundown of the cars and the history of the facility. And what what struck me as incredibly funny was that they said they have a lot of car clubs that come through. And, uh, uh, you know, all the time. And, but we were the youngest bunch we've seen in a while. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a long time since we've been called the youngest bunch. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's been a while. But I mean, the cars, I mean, what do they span from? They have cars from the 1920s amazing. up until the 70s ish. Uh, yeah, I think so. And, and, and as you said, Mr. Mott's about 90 years old. He was there. He was fantastic. April was there. They, they were just so nice. And it was just a very pleasant place. It's in Menifee, California. If you ever get a chance to go, go hit it up for sure. And it's not Mott's like the apple sauce. It's Mott's with an E, M-O-T-T-E. Yeah, he was very, uh, <laughs> very uh, stringent about the spelling of his name, wasn't he? He's like, there's an E <laughs> on the end. I mean, I couldn't let that slide without no. kind of bringing that up. But she said, you know, and it was great. They like, like they made, uh, uh, made fresh cupcakes for for the patrons and guests to come to the facility. And it's not yeah. something you would normally see at any other museum, but just house made. House made pastries, house made cupcakes. Uh, that I mean, and they were free. They weren't. There was no charge. Of course, they have a snack bar and stuff. But you know, right. just the, the hospitality. It goes to the hospitality yeah, it, and it, the it, genuine joy and pleasure that they get out of showcasing and opening up their doors, their barn doors, as a matter of fact. Right. To you know, an amazing car collection. Yeah, and, and including uh, some really cool tractors. I actually yeah. found the tractors to be almost amongst the probably amongst the most interesting yeah and uh i want to get back real quick just to go back to la quinta resort the uh the general manager of the resort's name is dermot and uh he was such a gracious host he even came to our dinner table along with noe the uh, gm and the the chef renee they actually came to our our big dinner table of 16 people and uh checked on us and made sure we were happy and i mean what a class act that place is oh a total class act 
And, and you know what, Chris, before we uh, end this segment, we should talk really quickly about the cars. You had the fun oh, of yeah. you had the fun of driving the Silver Spur Speed Edition, which had the uh, W12 engine, 650 horsepower and 900 foot pounds of torque. Uh, Bentley also makes a two door, which is the GT and the GTC. The GTC is convertible. Uh, and uh, those were those were great handling cars. Uh, they also we didn't have any, but they make a an SUV called the Bentayga. But uh, I think you were in can't remember if you were in the GT or the uh, Silver Spur. Uh, well, I actually had an opportunity to drive both. So you know, it's uh, the the Spur. You know, has a slightly smaller engine, has way more horsepower than you ever really will need. Right. Uh, the luxury again, it's it's. It's about the luxury of that car. I mean, so I, I, I sat down, and I was like, oh, my goodness. This is probably the most yeah. comfortable chair I've ever sat in. Yeah, it was an amazing and trip. And we, you just know. Just unbelievable cars. And, uh, you know, we encourage you well, to you take know, the. We should also talk about the good folks at Newport being uh, Bentley, uh, Bentley of Newport Beach. Yeah. You know, they really opened up their doors to, to this event. Uh, they were super hospitable. And, you know, it, it was great because normally when we do driving events that are specifically rated or work with dealerships, you know, usually the salesperson's like trying to jam lease or sales papers down your throat. Are you signing papers? Are you signing papers? And there was absolutely none of that. It was such a nice, uh, professional, yet laid back environment. It was yeah. just absolutely thrilling. No, I agree. If you're looking for a Bentley, that is definitely the place to check it out. But, uh, all right, Chris, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk Formula One news. This is the Speed Traveler Roadshow on KHTS Radio. All right. Well, welcome back to the Speed Traveler Roadshow here on KHTS Radio, AM 1220. You can also find us wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Charlie Frank, and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Everton. And uh, Chris, we are going to talk a little F1 in our final segment here. What a fantastic race at the Australian Grand Prix a week ago. Oh, my goodness. We finally have some exciting news about Formula One. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I think everybody already knows, but what, what a race it was in Australia. It, it promised to be a great opportunity for other teams other than the Red Bull to, to showcase their speed and their talent and uh, their, 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 their race craft of the drivers and then the performance of the cars, and Australia did not disappoint. I mean, Ferrari won two. Oh, yeah, that's really incredible. And for those of you who don't watch a lot of Formula One, the all-conquering Red Bull team and the all-conquering driver, Max Verstappen, who won, I think, 90-plus percent of the races last year, he, uh, he had an issue, but you felt – you felt that the Ferrari team with Carlos Sainz uh, had him anyways, but he had an issue I, I on really the third did. lap. I mean, Carlos Sainz, you know, coming back from a week off because of, of appendicitis, something that you went through, and you know how painful that is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, coming, you know, looking back at my uh, bike racing history and talking with some of the athletes I've worked with, I kind of felt that either Carlos Sainz was going to be completely off his game or hyper focused. Right. And it turned out to be the latter. He was hyper focused, and man, he was on fire. I mean, he didn't get pulled. He uh, he was just outside of pole by less than a tenth of a second, I believe. Right. That's how close it was for pole position. And then he got a great start in the race, starting P2 behind Max Verstappen, who had the pole, uh, and but was on him. You know, Max Verstappen has had a, uh, a a history of getting out of DRS range drag reduction system within the first five corners of the track on lap number one, and Carlos Sainz did not let that happen. No. And so I really feel, even though Max Verstappen had an issue with uh, the right, I believe it was the right rear brake, um, Carlos Sainz was right there, and I felt he was really going to challenge for the lead regardless of Max's issue. Yeah. Or I should say the Red Bull issue. Yeah, and just going down the the list, what what's interesting is uh, the order was really pretty shaken up. I mean, it, we had Ferrari 1-2 at the top, and then you had McLaren 3-4, uh, and then you had Sergio Perez down in, in fifth. And, uh, you know, it... Fifth, the, fifth, fifth yeah, place for what is the all-conquering car. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is the... 
A couple a couple things of note is the uh, uh, the Aston Martins were were decent. They don't seem to have the pace that they had last year, do they? Uh, and then also, no. uh, uh, well, go on. Yeah, let's talk about Aston Martin. No, no, for go ahead, Charlie. And I was gonna say, yeah, Aston yeah, Martin. No. Aston Martin just didn't. They they just don't seem to have. They're not. They weren't bad in qualifying, but they just don't seem to have the race pace, do they? No, they're definitely at this time not pushing at the front of the pack like they showed us at the beginning of last year. They're definitely at the leading edge of the mid pack, and their points definitely suggest that. Uh, I felt I felt it was unfortunate that uh, Fernando Alonso uh, got a 20 second penalty for what was considered brake checking George Russell in the Mercedes on the waning laps of the race. Right. Um, you know, uh, Eddie Jordan. Former team owner actually kind of criticized the penalty a bit, and he said basically said, "Sure, maybe he did brake check him, but it's up, it's up to the driver behind." I'm getting Papa Frank voice here. <laughs> it's up to the driver behind, in this case George Russell, to avoid what the car in front of him is doing. Yeah. Uh, so that 20 second penalty, albeit not catastrophic for the team, because it just pulled pushed Lance Stroll forward two positions or one position. And Fernando Alonso, I think, ended up eighth place instead of sixth place. They still scored decent points, but an unfortunate situation for, uh, in my opinion, as far as penalties being thrown out there. And to the pace of the Austin Martin, yeah, they they definitely need to pick it up. And maybe they can show some of that in uh, Japan coming up this weekend. Yeah, and before we uh, get off of Australia, we, we definitely have to bring up the fact that the Mercedes cars – you know, really weren't particularly fast in qualifying or the race. And, I mean, they were the all-conquering Formula One team for about eight years from 2014 to to uh, 2022. And, I mean, they just, you know, I, I don't know what's happening there. Maybe it's all the turmoil because their star driver, Lewis Hamilton's leaving at the end of the year. But, uh, man, I don't know. What do you think on uh, Mercedes? Yeah, they were definitely, even though they had a double DNF, that their pace did not represent the pace that Toto Wolf would normally demand. And there seems to be a little bit of controversy about Toto Wolf being at the helm of Mercedes and his continued leadership at that team. And maybe that's feeding into uh, uh, a bit of what's going on within that team. You know, the other factor is, I mean, we did just talk about Aston Martin, but they're doing a good job of pilfering a lot of technical people from other teams, including Mercedes. Right. So maybe maybe the team is just not as tightly knit as it needs to be. Yep. Uh, maybe they're not wholly thrilled with George Russell being their number one driver, even though they're committed to that concept. Yep. Uh, and like you mentioned, Lewis Hamilton going to Ferrari, that's a big change. You know, there's a lot of change happening at Mercedes right now. Yeah, and as you uh, mentioned a few minutes ago, the Japanese Grand Prix is coming up uh, this weekend, being April 5th. And it's interesting that the Japanese race had always been the second to last or last in some cases or third to last race of the year. And they moved it to spring this time. Yeah, you know, it's interesting that they did that. I, I don't know the whole story behind that, but I think one of the factors definitely could be the, the weather factor. We spoke about this briefly before we came on air, and I really feel strongly and agree with you that, you know, being in the springtime, there's so much less likely to get that adverse weather to roll in. And in Japan, particularly at the Suzuka track, uh, weather rolls in very, very quickly and can just as quickly go away. Yeah, it is it's pretty crazy. It's it's kind of like a spa in Belgium. You're up in the Ardennes forest and it's the first big la- mountainous landmass uh from the ocean. And so, you know, it it just has a tendency to rain a lot there and you're right. It's exactly the same with the Suzuka circuit, but should be should be a fun race. Are you expecting Red Bull to be back on pace? Uh I expect them to be better than they were in Australia, but I I think, again, there's a couple factors that are, are weighing on me to, to, to take take this as being another opportunity for Ferrari. Uh, the, the track, although it's different, has a lot of similar characteristics to the um, uh, 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 Australian Grand Prix circuit, uh, does Suzuka. 
And I honestly also feel Mercedes should be better because of some of the, the way the turns are laid out, that they should actually show some better pace. So we might see some interest, interesting moves from from Mercedes as well. McLaren's just kind of been hovering there, picking up the scraps, doing incredibly well. But I really feel like this race is another race for Ferrari to take another victory. Oh, I like that. You know what? I, I'm with you on that. And one thing we didn't mention, we're running out of time here, but real quick, is there is some chaos inside the all-conquering Red Bull team. For those of you who don't know, Christian Horner was accused of acting inappropriately towards a female employee. And uh, as far as Red Bull's concerned, they're like, oh, everything's great. It's all it's all resolved. We're good. But it, it's creating chaos with Max Verstappen. Uh, Max Verstappen's dad, who has an issue with Christian Horner, and there's a lot of turmoil within that organization. Yeah, you know, to take a, take a line out of uh, the Wizard of Oz, they're really trying to keep all of their issues behind the green curtain. Right. But a lot of that <laughs> is spilling out underneath the curtain, and we're starting to see some of the chinks in the armor. Yeah. And it it seems to have had an effect on their race race car in australia not their race craft i mean max verstappen is an incredible driver he's going to be fast no matter what he gets into uh but you were definitely seeing chinks in that armor right now and again perfect opportunity for ferrari to jump to pounce on that yep and that is the japanese grand prix coming up this weekend on espn if you're inside the states Chris, that is going to wrap it up for us today. Well, who's your pick, Charlie? Who are oh, you my pick. Or, or I, to pick? I I'm, think... I'm going to go. I'm going to go with uh, Charles Leclerc at Ferrari. What about you? Okay, you know what? I'm glad you're picking Leclerc because I'm going with Carlos Sainz. I feel that <laughs> Charles Leclerc is going to drive like a man possessed and really go for it because I feel he's been outdriven yeah. by Carlos Sainz. Agreed. Uh, so I'm fearful that he might do a, a, a Leclerc spin. Um, but Sainz has just shown dedication, focus. He's a driver without a contract for next year, and he's going to land. He wants to land someplace uh, uh, and show you know, land someplace good, and he wants to showcase that he's the better driver of the two on that Ferrari team. Oh yeah, we'll have a lot. Of the three. We'll have a lot to talk about next week. So thanks for joining us here on the Speed Traveler Roadshow on KHTS Radio. We will see you next week.